ever catch yourself wondering, like, how does my brain connect the word apple with, you know, a picture of a real apple? Or think about when you see a red light, it's almost like you don't even think, you just hit the brakes. Right. Our brains are linking symbols, ideas, actions all the time, and we don't even realize it. That's what we're going to dig into today, stimulus equivalence. Okay. We're looking at a chapter from Carol Pilgrim, Equivalence-Based Instruction. But don't worry, this isn't your average boring textbook stuff. Yeah, no jargon then, it's just <laughs> the good stuff. So what IE stimulus equivalence and why should I care? It's why when you see a picture of a dog or hear someone say dog, you instantly know that's a furry friend with four legs. Okay, I get that symbols represent the same thing, but there's got to be more to it. Definitely. It's about how our brains learn those connections without someone teaching us every single one. Pilgrim mentioned a researcher, Sidman. He worked with guys who'd never learned to read right. Sidman's research was huge E. He used matching to sample. Imagine those picture flashcards. Taught these guys to match spoken words to pictures, then later, those same words, but written down. Sounds like pretty normal teaching, so what's the big deal? Get this. They started showing reading comprehension without ever being directly taught those words. Like, their brains just figured it out. Hold on. They saw, say, a picture of a cat and then picked out the word cat, even though they'd never been shown that specific pairing. Exactly. They got that those symbols, whether they heard them or saw them, were interchangeable part of the same equivalence class up in their brains. Their brains were like picture of cat equals the word cat and the word cat equals the written word cat so oh. the picture must equal the written word too <laughs> that's wild what are the limits of our brains even right and all that just from a pretty simple teaching method imagine what we could do if we really use this equivalence power like in schools in life it's like giving someone the key to a whole room full of knowledge instead of just one fact at a time but hold on before we get too ahead of ourselves the chapter mentions something called transfer a function. Sounds important, but kind of scary, honestly. Can you break it down for me? Of course. Transfer a function basically means once you learn something new about one thing in that equivalence class, it's like your brain automatically knows it about all the other things in that class, too. Okay, real world example, please. I need to see it to believe it, you know. <laughs> okay. Imagine you learn that a dime is worth 10 cents. Then you learn that two nickels are also worth 10 cents. Well, with transfer function, you automatically understand that a dime and two nickels are basically the same, even though nobody directly told you that. Whoa, that's actually kind of mind-blowing. Like, our brains are creating these connections without us even realizing it. So even something as simple as understanding money or reading relies on this equivalence thing. It's like this invisible web of meaning our brain's building all the time. Exactly. And it doesn't stop there. It's not like those classes are set in stone either. What do you mean? Think about it. You learn soda is a type of drink. That's your starting point, right? Then you learn juice is also a drink. Boom, class expansion. Your brain's idea of drink just grew. Huh. And then there's class merger, when two separate ideas combine. Like, you might learn about quarters and dollars is totally different, but then you get that four quarters, make a dollar, suddenly, bam, class merger. Our understanding of how these symbols connect can get crazy complex. It's like those mind maps where one thought branches out to a million others. Pilgrim really digs into how Sidman's work made this whole symbolic function idea rock solid. Oh, totally. Sidman didn't just want to teach skills, he wanted to know how we understand anything. He said that to get symbolic function, you can't just guess someone understands something by watching them. You gotta look for specific things they do that prove it, like can they use that knowledge in totally new ways without being directly taught. So not just parroting back information, but actually getting the deeper meaning. Kind of like when a kid realizes a broken cookie is still the same amount of cookie, just in different pieces. Yes. It's about the underlying concept, not just what it looks like on the surface. And to prove that was happening, Sidman, he got clever. How so? What did he do? Designed some seriously smart experiments. He figured if someone really understands those symbols are all connected, they should be able to show that in tons of ways, not just how they were taught. So no memorizing allowed. You got to be able to actually use it in the real world. It's like in those cooking shows. OK, time to see if this dish can stand the heat. We're putting that equivalence knowledge to the test. Uh, <laughs> I like that. Speaking of testing knowledge. Ooh, this is getting good. Tell me more about those tests. What else was interesting about them? Well, Pilgrim mentions these things like compound stimuli, basically showing a picture A and D saying the word at the same time. Seems like that could be really helpful for things like, I don't know, spelling. 
where you have to put letters together to make a word. Exactly. You're making those connections super clear. And then there's class-specific reinforcement. Think of it like a kid gets a sticker for matching animal pictures, right? But then for matching vehicles, they get a little toy. So the reward helps them get the category even more. That's smart. Yeah. It really shows how much thought goes into teaching this way. You got to know the rules, but then get creative to make it work for different people. And Pilgrim has tons of examples of how that's happening out in the real world, like teaching functional math skills. Think about how hard it is to teach fractions, decimals, all that. But equivalence based instruction, it actually helps people get those ideas and use them in their lives. It's that aha. Uh -huh moment, right? Mm. When a kid finally understands, like a dime is the same as two nickels or 10 pennies. It's not memorizing anymore. It's understanding what that money actually means. Exactly. And once they get that, they can use it everywhere. Counting change at the store, figuring out if they have enough for something they want. We're talking about giving people the tools to handle real life, to be more independent. That's it. And it goes way beyond that. The chapter talks about how this approach helps teach life skills, like going shopping, following a schedule, even asking for things using those communication devices some folks use. It's kind of amazing how this one concept, this brain linking symbols thing can make such a huge difference. It really is. And we're just getting started, honestly. Pilgrim even talks about how it helps kids with sensory problems like those who can't see or hear well, they can learn braille or make sense of sounds they hear through implants. It's like you're building a bridge between what their senses are telling them. Yeah. And it's not just for kids either. What about adults, like after an injury or something? Lots of research going on there. Pilgrim talks about studies where equivalence-based instruction helps people relearn things like matching a name to a face or even recognizing emotions on people's faces. Man, we take that stuff for granted. But it's so important for just talking to people, going about your day. It is, it is. And to see this approach help folks get those connections back, to feel in control again, that's powerful stuff. It reminds us that learning never stops. No matter what life throws at you, there's always a chance to grow. Makes you think though, if this works so well, why isn't everyone doing it? I've wondered that myself. And actually, Pilgrim brings up a good point. Sidman, he really pushed this idea of equivalence as like a core part of how our brains work, right? But other researchers, they've got different theories about why we learn this way. Okay, so what are these other viewpoints then? Yeah. Pilgrim focuses on two, naming theory and relational frame theory. And just a heads up, you might have to explain those like I'm five. They sound kind of complicated. No worries. Yeah. yeah, they sound fancy, but basically both of them say that learning and experience are what make us good with symbols. So it's not that we're born knowing this stuff. It's that we learn it through like specific training and stuff. So it's not pre-programmed. It's learned through how we interact with the world. Exactly. Like naming theory. That one says it's super important to learn the names of things and then how to react when you hear those names. It's about getting that two-way street between the word and the thing it stands for. So it's not just saying dog when I see a picture of dog. It's also knowing that when someone says dog, they mean that same furry creature, the word and the image, two sides of the same coin. You got it. And once you get that, that's the base for a more complicated language for thinking with symbols. Okay, I think I'm following. So what about relational frame theory then? How's that fit in? Relational frame theory, that one zooms out a bit. It says... Equivalence is just one type of relationship we learn. It's not just A equals B. It's learning to react to things based on how they relate to each other, making this whole web of meanings in our heads. So not just knowing two things are the same, but getting all sorts of connections, like this one's bigger than that one, or this is the opposite of that, or even this is a piece of that bigger thing. Yes. It's about how those symbols connect in all these cool and complex ways. It sounds like these other theories add some detail to how we figure out and use symbols. But do they actually help us do anything differently? For sure. Both naming theory and relational frame theory have led to some really neat applications. Take naming theory folks who like that idea. They've made whole systems for teaching those basic listening and speaking skills that are like the foundation for understanding symbols. Super helpful for little kids or people who have a tougher time with learning. So it's breaking those big, complicated skills down into smaller steps, like teaching a kid to ride a bike, but starting with training wheels first. 
perfect analogy, and making sure they've got each step down before moving on. For example, there was this study where they taught kids to point to a picture when they heard its name, and also to say the name of a picture when they saw it. Turns out, that helped those kids use those words in conversations way better. We're talking about being able to have a back and forth to actually use those words, not just recognize them. They weren't just memorizing words, they were learning how to use them for real. That's a huge step. It is. Shows how all these different parts of language work together. Another study, they used a similar approach to help kids with autism learn to name things within categories like different vehicles or parts of the body. And, you know, that stuff's crucial for talking to people, for fitting in. It's mind-blowing that these simple exercises can make such a big difference in how a child sees and interacts with the world. But you also mentioned relational frame theory being used for, like, those trickier behaviors some folks have. How's that work? One area it's showing a lot of promise is with people who struggle with gambling. Think about it. How do you break those habits where someone's so focused on winning they don't think about the risks? That instant gratification versus thinking about what might happen later, right? Tough one. Exactly. And so researchers are using relational frame theory to see if it can help people reframe those choices. So instead of just seeing the potential win, they start considering the bigger picture, the consequences, all that. Uh -huh. How do they do that? One study used this really neat trick. They taught people to link certain colors with either good choices or bad choices. Then, when they were shown a gambling scenario, those colors actually swayed their decision. They picked the less risky option way more often. Wow, so just seeing a color could help someone break out of that automatic gotta gamble mindset. That's really something. It is. It shows how powerful those relationships we build in our minds can be. Even without realizing it, they're shaping our choices, our behaviors, everything. This is also fascinating. We've talked about using equivalence-based instruction to teach people new skills, but Pilgrim also gets into some really interesting stuff about using this in, get this, college. Might sound weird at first, right? <laughs> but remember, equivalence class formation is all about understanding connections between ideas. And that is key for learning, no matter what you're studying. Good point. So how are professors using this with college students? Give me the inside scoop. Oh, there are some really cool examples. One study used it to teach this really tough concept in psychology statistical interaction. It's stats stuff, so. Stats. Yeah, I can see why they need extra help with that. So how'd it go? Did it actually work? What's amazing is the students who learned about it through equivalence-based instruction did way better on tests than the ones who just had lectures or nothing special. So they weren't just memorizing, they were actually understanding it. That's a game changer. It is. And there are other studies showing the same thing, even in subjects like anatomy and how the brain works. So it's not just about memorizing facts, it's about helping students really grasp the concepts, which Let's be honest, is the whole point of learning. Exactly. It's like we're giving them the tools to figure things out, not just handing them a bunch of info to remember. It's like we're teaching them how to learn, not just what to learn. That's incredible. That's the goal. And that's a skill that'll stick with them no matter what they do in life. This has been amazing so far. We've covered so much from the basics of this equivalent stuff to how it's changing things in education and therapy. Really shows you how amazing our brains are, how much we can adapt and learn. But before we wrap up, there's one thing that's been bugging me. We've talked about humans, right? But what about animals? Could they do this equivalence class thing? Researchers have been trying to figure that out for ages, because if this is how we do symbolic thought, could animals do it too? It's still up in the air, but there have been some crazy studies with sea lions that make you wonder. Sea lions learning symbols. Come on, you have to tell me more. <laughs> so. There were these two, Rocky and Rio. They trained for years learning to match symbols and understand how they were connected. And get this, they started making connections they'd never even been taught. It's like their brains were putting the pieces together on their own, which makes you think maybe equivalence is possible for them. Wow, that's wild. Really makes you think twice about what we call intelligence and who has it, you know? It really yeah. does make you wonder, like, what else are animals thinking that we just don't get? Totally. And it makes you think about the bigger picture of this whole research area. It's not just about us, you know, it's about what's possible, period. It's like unlocking a whole new level of how we see intelligence, how we see other species even. Exactly. But even sticking with humans, we've got a long way to go. We talked about how huge equivalence-based instruction is already, but imagine like making it even better, trying it in new ways with different groups of people. That's what I love about science. There's always more to discover, more questions to ask. Couldn't agree more. 
This deep dive, it's really just the tip of the iceberg for this whole field. But if there's one thing I want our listener to walk away with, it's that sense of awe. Our brains are amazing learning machines. Yeah, and we should never take for granted those little connections our brain's making all the time. Yeah. They all add up to this incredible thing, being able to understand the world, be a part of it. So true. Next time you see a stop sign, hear your favorite song, even smell those cookies baking. Ooh, cookies. Those things you just do without thinking. They all come from this journey of learning and connecting that started way back. This has been an incredible deep dive. Thank you so much for nerding out with me about stimulus equivalents. Anytime. I'm always yeah. up for talking about this stuff. It's fascinating. And for our listener, keep those brains buzzing. Keep learning. Keep asking questions. And never, ever underestimate the power of those aha moments. You never know what you might unlock. <laughs>